In this video, we're going to work out several more examples where we evaluate surface integrals and flux integrals. Our first example, we should have a regular surface integral, so it's not a flux integral. Our surface here it has the equation z equals x plus y squared, and we're going to look at that portion of the surface uh, be, over the rectangle where x goes from 0 to 1 and y goes from 0 to 2. So we've got a function of x and y, so we can go ahead and parameterize this surface using x and y. And then since we have our surface described as a function of x and y, we can use this formula here to calculate ds. And that we know is actually the same as the surface area formula. So if I take the partial with respect to x, I'll get 1. If I take the partial with respect to y, I'll get 2y. If I square those, then I'll have 4y squared plus 1 plus 1. So that'll make radical 2 plus 4y squared. So then our integral in our parameter space becomes y times radical 2 plus 4y squared dx dy. And then our bounds are just from 0 to 1 and 0 to 2. So we'll need a u substitution to evaluate the integral with respect to y. The integral with respect to x is very simple because there is no x in the integrand. So that's just considered a constant. So let's go ahead and make our u substitution. We'll go ahead and change our uh, limits as well and find the antiderivative and evaluate that between 2 and 18 to get 1 12th parentheses 18 radical 18 minus 2 radical 2. Let's look at another surface integral. It's not a flux integral, but now our surface is a little bit more complicated. It's actually composed of three separate surfaces. The first surface is a portion of a cylinder with radius 1 centered on the z-axis. And it's the between S2. Now S2 is just the unit disk and in the xy plane. And S3 is a portion of the plane which is inside the cylinder. So it looks something like this right here. So we've cut the cylinder with a plane and we're gonna have the bottom of the cylinder be in the xy plane. So we're going to evaluate this surface integral one surface at a time, or one part of this uh, combined surface at a time. So for the cylinder, we'll go ahead and use uh, essentially cylindrical co coordinates. We'll have z as one parameter, theta as the other parameter. On the surface of the cylinder, r is identically one. So we don't need to have r as a variable. r is the constant one. We do have to be careful about z. z is going between 0 and 1 plus x, or 1 plus cosine theta. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, find out what our ds is going to be. So we need r sub theta and r sub z. Go ahead and form the cross product and find the magnitude, which equals 1. Now, if that, this shouldn't surprise us because, again, since this is essentially uh, cylindrical coordinates, uh, if r had been a parameter, we would expect that our ds would be r dA. But since r is 1, it's just 1 dA. All right, let's evaluate it now using our parameter space. So uh, dA now is just dz d theta. It's multiplied times 1, so no change there. Z is the integrand, so uh, and Z is going between 0 and 1 plus cosine theta. And then theta goes all the way around the Z axis, so it goes from 0 to 2 pi. So antiderivative is 1 half Z squared. Uh, to evaluate that, I'll need to use 
foil with the one plus cosine theta. So I'll get three terms out of here. I'll go ahead and factor the one half out in front. And so then I'll need to use my identity for cosine squared theta. And now let's just see what's going to happen here. I'll have the one half outside the integral. I'll have one plus another half. So three halves inside the integral. And the other two are uh, cosine functions whose antiderivatives will be sine functions. But when I evaluate that sine of zero, sine of two pi, sine of any multiple of pi is going to be uh, the same as sine of zero. And so that will contribute nothing. The cosine terms here will contribute nothing to the evaluation. So I'm just really left with the constants. And so I'd have half times the three halves times two pi, giving me three pi over two. And that's only for the cylinder wall of this surface. Now for the disk. So we'll go ahead and use polar coordinates here to parameterize uh, the disk. Z is identically zero everywhere on the disk. And oh, well, since Z is identically zero, that means the integrand is identically zero because our integrand is Z. Everywhere on this disk then the integrand is zero, so that will just evaluate to zero. So we will not have any contribution to the final answer from the bottom disk. What about this ellipse, which is the portion of that plane that cuts through the, the cylinder? Well, we'll go ahead and just use x and y as uh, our parameter since we have uh, z equals x plus 1. That's a, a function of uh, x only. And so then we can go ahead and find our ds. First, we'll take the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, form the cross product, and then find the magnitude of that cross product, which is a constant radical 2. So uh, we'll just have radical 2 times dA is dS for this integral. Now z is x plus 1 on this surface. I have the radical 2 from my dS part. Uh, the region R here is uh, the projection onto the xy plane, which is that unit disk. So we will change to polar. So now I'm going to have, instead of x plus 1, r cosine theta plus 1, dA becomes r d, r d r d theta. And my bounds are from 0 to 1 on r and 0 to 2 pi on theta. And I still have the multiplying factor of radical 2. So evaluating that antiderivative first with respect to r, I'd have r squared cosine theta, so that's 1 third r cubed cosine theta with the antiderivative. The antiderivative of r is 1 half r squared. Evaluate that between 0 and 1. That's pretty simple. So we're left with 1 third cosine theta plus 1 half d theta. I take the antiderivative just as in the, we saw in the other integral. This cosine theta will make no contribution because the bounds of integration are 0 and 2 pi. So I'm just left with finding what, radical 2 times a half times 2 pi, and that'll just be radical 2 pi. So altogether, combining all three surfaces, I wind up with 3 pi over 2 from S1 plus radical 2 pi from S3. In our third example, we have a hemisphere it's the upper part of the hemisphere, but we're told that the orientation is downward. So this would be a negatively oriented hemisphere. Its radius is 2, and we're doing a flux integral here. This is a flux integral, so we do have to, of course, pay attention to the orientation, which means we have to pay attention to the unit normal vector. 
So we're going to look at two different solutions here. Our first solution, we're going to parameterize it using phi and theta. So uh, we get this from uh, the spherical coordinates with, on the surface, rho identically equaling 2. And so I'm going to go ahead and factor that 2 out because we've seen this uh, representation before. Now let's pay attention here. Phi only goes between 0 and pi over 2 because we have the uh, upper part of the hemisphere, the part of the hemisphere where z is greater than or equal to 0. Now theta goes between 0 and 2 pi because we're going all the way around the z axis. All right, and so we've seen these uh, partials before, except for the multiplying factor of 2. So here's the partial with respect to phi, the partial with respect to theta. When I form the cross product, I'll just be able to multiply the cross product of these two vectors without the 2 by 2 and then by 2 again. So the final answer will be multiplied by 4. And so uh, I've got, uh, so sine squared phi cosine theta, sine squared phi sine theta, and cosine phi sine phi. So I may want to factor out the sine phi uh, from there. And, um, you know, what's left inside here, it looks like I'm missing uh, some phi's. Let me go ahead and put those in there. Good. Um, so really, this is just you know x, y, and z. It's parallel to the position vector x, y, z. Uh, but the problem here is that this normal vector is pointing upward. We want a downward oriented uh, surface, which is fine. We'll just use then the opposite of that. We'll just take the negative. So I'll just put the negative on the outside. Now we have negative 4 sine phi. All right, so what's left? Let's convert our uh, vector field to be in terms of phi and theta. So I'll replace y with 2 sine phi sine theta, negative x with negative 2 sine phi cosine theta, and 2z will be 4 cosine phi. And now I could factor out what a two I could from that. All right, let's go ahead and factor out a two from that, because now I've got to do a dot product of that vector. So this this vector here with the vector above it. And so on the outside, I'll have the negative eight sine phi. When I multiply these two together, I'll get sine squared phi cosine theta uh, sine. One of these should be theta. Now oh, the second one should be theta. Let's go ahead and fix that up here. All right, good deal. And then, uh, so then I'll have these two multiply together. So negative sine squared phi sine theta cosine theta, and then um, two cosine squared phi. All right, uh, but the first two terms are opposites of each other, so they'll add to make zero. So I'll wind up with negative 16 sine phi cosine squared phi. And I'll make my correction up here a couple more times as we go along. Give you a chance to think about what's coming next, which would be to actually evaluate the integral now. So just kind of overwrite that. And uh, so we're going over the uh, phi and theta, so our r is just this rectangle in the phi theta plane. 
And so our integrand is negative 16 sine phi cosine squared phi. We can find the antiderivative with respect to phi by using just a basic u substitution. And so we'll go ahead and do that next. And then uh, I'll bring the 16 out of 3. Now, when I make this u substitution, and I apologize, it's, it's worth emphasizing. So here we're going to say u equals cosine phi, and du then is negative sine phi d phi. So that negative that comes out of the du is going to be multiplied times the negative that we already have, and that's going to give us a positive, and positive 16 thirds. Evaluate that between 0 and pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, but cosine of 0 is 1. So that's going to give us actually a negative 1 on the inside. Negative 1, then, evaluate that between uh, 0 and 2 pi. So I'd have negative 1 times 2 pi times 16 over 32, which is negative 32 pi over 3. All right. That's one way of doing it. We can use that parameterization using phi and theta. However, if I, because I'm using only half of the sphere, I could think of this surface as a function of x and y. I could solve for z. It's only the positive square root because z is greater than or equal to 0. Moreover, geometrically, I know that if I have a, a sphere, that the normal vector is going to be parallel to a line that runs through the origin and goes out to the point on the surface. Uh, the way I've drawn it then, that you know, heading out of the sphere, that would be our upward pointing normal. And it would just have the, I just used the components of the position vector of the point on the sphere, so x, y, and z. Now that's not a unit normal. It is a normal vector. So let me put a hat to emphasize that to get a unit normal, I need to divide by the length. The length then would be radical x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, so the radical of that would be 2. So the upward pointing normal would be just 1 half uh, times the position vector x, y, z. But I don't want the upward pointing normal, I want the downward pointing normal, our surface is downward oriented. So again, I'll just multiply that times negative 1. So I could use this as my normal vector. Since I've got a surface which is a function of x and y, I could parameterize this using x and y as my parameters, in which case my ds would just be this surface area expression here. I would need to find the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y. And there's, I could just use this formula directly, but I'm going to show you again something that we did in a previous example. I'm going to start with z squared equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and then take the partial with respect to x of both sides. I'll have to use the chain rule uh, when I take the partial of z with respect to x, and then just solve that for the partial of z with respect to x, which is the same as the partial of f with respect to x, and I get negative x over z. And I could do the same thing for uh, y and get the partial of f with respect to y is negative y over z. Now, if I put those expressions into my formula for ds, I would get x squared over z squared plus y squared over z squared plus 1, which I'll write as z squared over z squared. And so I have a common denominator. The top would be x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is 4, and radical 4 is 2. 
the bottom is just z squared and radical z squared, since z is not negative, is just plain old z. So my expression for ds simplifies to 2 over z dA. Now notice that throughout here, I haven't made any real substitution for z yet, and I'm not going to until the very end um, before I start to work on evaluating the integral. And the reason is that what's my next step? Well, I would want to find uh, the product of my dot product of my vector field with my unit normal, and then multiply that times ds. So I, since I'm using x, y, x and y as parameters, and I haven't made any substitutions for z, I'm just going to go ahead and take the dot product of this vector, the original vector for my vector field, with this vector, which is my downward pointing unit normal. And then I'll multiply that times 2 over z dA, which is my ds. Now, if I form this dot product, I'll have x times y, and then add that to y times negative x, add that to z times 2z. So I would have xy minus xy plus 2z squared. I have the negative 1 half from the unit normal pointing downward. I have a 2 over z. That comes from the ds, which is 2 over z dA. And I still have to keep that dA. So the xy minus xy makes 0. Then I'm only left with 2z squared in the parentheses. I can divide 1z out. I can divide the 2s out, which are outside. And that simplifies to being just negative 2z dA. So now my flux integral is just going to be the double integral over r. r is my parametric region. Since my parameters are x and y, that would just be the projection onto the xy plane, and that's the disk with radius 2 of negative 2z dA. So at this point, let's go ahead and replace z with radical 4 minus x squared minus y squared dA. And since I have a polar region and I look at my integrand, I see it would be easy to convert my integrand to polar coordinates. We're going to convert everything to polar. So now my minus x squared minus y squared will be minus r squared. dA will be r dr d theta. And um, to evaluate this with respect to r, well, to find the antiderivative, I'll make a u substitution and go ahead and change my bounds of integration. And evaluate that with res uh, I mean that antiderivative now in terms of u. Uh, so then I'll have what uh, a negative eight. So negative sixteen over three. After I do the u evaluation, uh, that's just a constant. So since I'm taking the integral of a constant from zero to two pi, I could just take that constant and multiply it times two pi, and I'll get this. Uh, so negative 16 over 3 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 d theta, and that would just be negative 32 pi over 3. So the same solution I got before. Now, it really is a matter of how comfortable you are. Uh, either one of these parameterizations will work. Uh, I kind of like this because it uh, reinforces uh, some uh, additional information from the actual problem, so the geometry of the problem. Uh, and uh, if you understand that, then you don't really need to do all of the steps that I showed here. You probably could have, uh, you know, for example, just realized that, oh, I want the downward pointing union normal. That's what I need here. And then you could calculate this ds uh, in a little bit uh, fewer steps than what I used, and get to a very simple integrand. Our last example now has a very simple surface. It's just a box. It has a relatively simple integrand, but, and, and the box is positively oriented. We're doing a 
flux integral, so we better be careful about the orientation. Now, a box is a closed surface, so remember positively oriented for closed surface means that we're going to have the outward normal. Oops. Really want the outward facing normal vector for a closed surface. So that's going to be important. So the way that we're going to evaluate this is we're going to uh, work on a separate uh, integral for all six faces. So we have a top and a bottom, a front and a back, and a left and a right. And again, we have a positively oriented closed surface, so we must always use the outward facing normal vector. So for example, on the top here, well, I want the normal vector to point up because pointing up is out of the box. And so the equation of that surface is just z equals two. X goes between negative one and positive one. Y goes between zero and two. And our unit normal vector is just uh, our unit coordinate vector k, pointing straight up in the positive z direction. So now if I take the dot product of uh, f dotted with my unit normal vector, well, that would just be the k component of f, and that's 3z. But on this surface, z is identically 2, so it's just going to be... Um, the integrand is just going to be 6. Now ds, in this case, is just going to be dx dy. And um, our bounds are determined by our bounds on x and y. So this is just 6 times the area of that face. So 3 times 2 gives me 6. 6 times the area. And the area is what? 2 times 2. So 6 times 4 is 24. Let's look at the bottom. What's different about the bottom? Uh, well, it's still the same area. Obviously, it's in a different location. But most importantly, it, to get the outward facing normal, now it has to be facing down to come out of the box. So here's z equals negative 1. We have the same bounds on x and y. But our unit normal vector now is negative k. So our f dot n is going to be the opposite of the k component of f, so negative 3z. So the surface integral over the bottom is just going to be the integral of negative 3 times z, but z is identically negative 1. So negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3 times the area of the bottom which we said was 4. So 3 times 4 will give me 12. All right, what about the front here? So the front, in the front, I mean uh, the, the portion here uh, where uh, x is a portion of the plane where x equals 1. So again, we need the outward facing normal. So x equals 1. Our bounds on y go from 0 to 2, and z, they go from negative 1 to positive 2. That's what this portion is telling me for z. The unit normal is pointing in the positive x direction, so the uh, i unit vector. So when I take the dot product, it's just going to be the i component of the f vector, which is 2x. But x is identically 1. So when I form the integral, I'll just have 2 times 1 as the integrand. That's a constant. So I'll just take that constant 2 and multiply it times the area of that face. Uh, and that is, the area of that face is 3 times 2 is 6. So 6 times 2 will give me 12. What about at the back? Well, 
the back, that's where x equals negative 1. Same bounds on y and z as I had in the front. But my normal vector now is pointing out the back. That is in the negative i direction. And so the dot product will be the opposite of the i component, so negative 2x. Now, here I have a negative 2 times, well, what is x? x is identically negative 1. So I still get 2 as my uh, integrand, still have the same bounds. So I'm still going to get 12 for the value of the surface integral. All right, we're left with left and right. So on the left, that's where uh, y equals 0. And my unit normal has to be pointing out of the box. So that's going to be in the negative j direction. So the dot product is going to be the opposite of the j component of f. So the opposite of negative y is positive y. Turns out it's really not that important because the uh, because y our integrand y is identically zero uh, for this part of the surface, so its value is going to be zero. Now on the right face, we have uh, y equal to two, same bounds on x and y. Now our unit normal vector pointing out of the box is pointing in the positive j direction. So my dot product is just going to be the j component of f, which is negative y. So then I'll have to uh, take uh, my y value is 2. So negative y would be negative 2. And that's just a constant. And so I'll just multiply that times the area. The area of that surface is 2 units by 3 units, so 6 times negative 2 will give me negative 12. So now to get the flux across the entire box. Now, remember what flux is. Flux is the net amount of the vector field which flows out of the box. So flux will be positive if more flows out than flows in. So let's just add up how much is the net amount flowing out through each surface. And so we got our 24 plus a 12 plus another 12 plus another 12 plus a 0 and then minus 12. And that'll give us 48. So that's our last example. They do take some time, but if you look at it systematically, you can work through them.